And so today I just want to talk about why it's important to be thankful after Thanksgiving. Why it's important to be thankful after Thanksgiving. You know, sometimes we set these bars up and we, we get to those things and then we kind of leave them behind. But that's not exactly what God said. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible says, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and he says, In all circumstances, be thankful or be, give thanks in all circumstances. Now, he didn't say give thanks for all th- circumstances. He said in the midst of them, give thanks. Now, there are things that happen in your life that you're not thankful for. You're thankful in the middle of it, but you know there are some things that have happened that I'm not necessarily grateful that they happened. I'm just grateful that God was with me when they happened. And, and, but we need to learn to continue an attitude of thanksgiving no matter what our circumstance is. And uh, what happens is we sometimes, you know, we'll have this moment and then we move on. And one of the things in the, in the American culture is, you know, we move from thanksgiving into this full force of Christmas and, 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 and you know, we need to remind ourselves to be thankful beyond the Christmas, the Thanksgiving holiday. It will protect us from the traps that Satan wants to use to steal the joy that is supposed to be in Christmas. I'm going to say that again. It will protect us from the traps that Satan wants to bring into your life that will steal the joys that are supposed to be a part of a Christmas holiday. Now, you know, Christmas is supposed to be, we've got this idealized view of what Christmas is supposed to be, and we've got it all set up, and then most of the time what happens, we get let down. How many many of you have ever experienced that? You know, it's just, it it becomes less. And so we set these expectations up, and, and what I think, I want to just say with this, that when you maintain an attitude of gratitude, and I know that sounds Horny, but we're going to use it anyway. When you maintain an attitude of gratitude, it will protect us from the discontent, the materialism, and the sense of failure that can be so easily associated with our celebration of Christmas. You know, how many of we buy into this image and we get this whole idea that we have to have certain things or it has to look a certain way or a holiday has to fall into this perfect Hollywood vision of what it's supposed to be? How many know it never does? And it never is. And we never have. It just doesn't work that way. And so what happens is we get these things that Satan just loves to bring into our life. You know, how many of you that he loves to bring a sense of failure to your life? Or how many of you know he loves for you to become discontent? I mean, you know that that's one of the things he just loves to bring into your life. Or, or, Or one of the things you get is that you somehow are not enough. And that's what he does in this holiday. And what I want to just, uh, just encourage you, one of the greatest ways to counteract his efforts in our life is to maintain an attitude of gratitude. I know that's, y'all are going to give me grief all the time for saying that, but you'll remember it. <laughs> you'll remember it. So why is it important to be thankful after Thanksgiving? Now, I, I, there's so often that we find that hard things happen in the holidays. You ever, you ever notice that? The hard things happen all the time. But in the holidays, we pay particular attention to them. When we have a loss of a loved one or a, a tragic situation or anything, it just gets amplified because we have expectations and one of the, what we need to see is that God wants to counteract all this stuff that comes into our life and wants us to find a way to be thankful in the midst of all that. But here's the thing. Why is it important to be thankful after Thanksgiving? Number one, it puts the focus back on Jesus and off of us. How I mean, you know when we get consumed with us, we're in trouble? And it's easy to do. And if you, if you kind of wonder about that, just kind of do a, a, a journal of your prayer life. Because in your prayer life, you'll find out where your focus is. And, and, and I understand, you know, our, our world is our world, and we kind of get her centered around that, and I, I don't begrudge you that. But when we get in our prayer life, if we find ourselves only talking to God about us and not about Him, <laughs> we're in trouble. 
And so uh, we want to put our focus back on, on, on Jesus and kind of get it off of us. Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. And let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from the east, the west, the north, and the south. And, and this is a beautiful psalm. If you ever get a chance to read it, and we often use it at Thanksgiving, but it tells the story of how God will intervene into the, the mess that is the human condition and bring people back to grace. And he says this to this repeated refrain that's throughout the, the, the especially the Old Testament. You hear this over and over again. Uh, David uses it over and over and over again, where he says, Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, and his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. There's something powerful as we move into the Christmas season that if our vision can get on Jesus and, and, and we can get loose uh, lose our, our perspective of only of our environment, but begin to see Jesus. Here's what will happen. When we do that, we in Christmas time get our vision blurred by the peripheral noise and sights. Yet an attitude of gratitude that comes when we tell our story of redemption puts the focus back on Jesus and off of the false expectations and wants. I'm going to say that again. I, I just... When we get our vision back on Jesus, it counteracts that, that blurriness that happens in the world around us. How do you know right now at Christmas, the one thing that you don't hear a lot about in the, uh, the realm of the world is about Jesus. You hear about all kinds of things. You hear about all kinds of stuff, and most of it has nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. What we need to do as Christians is to put the focus back on where it belongs, which is back on Jesus. How I many you know it's his birthday? How I many of you will know if your birthday, if, if you had a birthday and all the people that came to your party came looking for something they were going to get, I mean, you know, that would not be a fun birthday party. And yet, that's what we do. We have taken it and moved it completely off of Jesus. We're no longer grateful for what, even as we heard this day, that God sent his son so that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This love of God displayed in our life, and it's, a, it's written a story in our life. How many of you have a story of redemption? Oh, I hope all of you do. And if you haven't, I want to encourage you to get one. Here's the deal. Jesus came to give you a story of redemption. Which is cool, because you know next week, you know what we're going to do? We're going to baptize people. If you haven't been baptized, we encourage you to call us. We'll make that happen, but we're going to baptize, and we want you to come and celebrate with us because it's a great way that we tell that story of redemption. It's our way of saying to anybody who will listen, I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I died, now I live. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's cool. So if you haven't been baptized, now's the time. Amen? Come on now. <laughs> you see, we need to put the focus back where it is. We need to thank God for who He is. We need to thank Him for what He's done. And we need to thank Him in advance of what He will do. The second thing, why this is important to maintain this attitude of gratitude past Thanksgiving. I know I'm saying it to be irritating, I think. <laughs> the second thing is it breaks the chains of discontent. It breaks the chains of discontent. And we fall into to the, to the, the bondage of discontent so easily. How oh. you, you know it's easy to get unhappy with where your life is? 
we begin to measure our life by the standards of this world, and we begin to see that we don't measure up according to that guideline, and we get discontent. You know, and if you really want to get discontent, just watch TV. Really, I mean, just think about it. Because here's what's happening, and especially in broadcast TV now, uh, and even on cable, every time you watch a TV show, what happens about every five minutes? You get a commercial. And in that commercial, and especially this time of year, they're showing you why you should be discontented with your life. Because you don't have this car or that thing or this situation. It's preaching discontent. Matter of fact, marketing is all about creating discontent. It's about showing you that what you are and what you have is not good enough. And if you buy our product, it will be till we have another product. And so what we want to understand is when we get an attitude of gratitude, when we begin to move into thanksgiving, when we begin to say beyond just uh, you know, the prayer of thanksgiving we do on, a, a, on thanksgiving at, a, at our dinner, when we begin to live a life of gratitude, when we begin to live it out, it breaks that chain of discontent in our life. We begin to understand that God has blessed us beyond measure right where we are. Paul understood this when he wrote to the Philippian church. He's writing from jail. <laughs> this is called the letter of joy. And he wrote it from jail. He wrote it from jail. But he says in chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty, plenty or in want. And here's the verse that we often quote, but we put it contextually in the previous verses. He's saying, here's what I can do. I can handle my circumstance because here's the key. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. What he's saying is, I am grateful because in Jesus I am complete. I don't need the stuff of this world. I have enough. In Christ, he is enough. If I have Christ, I have all I need. And I find freedom from the tentacles of want. So Lord, today I want to thank you for what I have in you. Not what maybe I think I need, but I want to thank you today for what I have. I have been adopted into the family of God, and I have been declared to be a son of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I have freedom from the shackles of sin. Sin cannot hold me, for the blood of Jesus has set me free. I have the benefits of grace. He has bestowed upon me riches which are beyond fathomable understanding. I have freedom from fear and lack, and I have a God who loves me. Man, when you begin to thank Him for what you have, it breaks those shackles of discontent. You begin to realize, as Paul said, we who maybe look poor to the world are rich beyond measure. I want to challenge us as we move through this season to operate with gratitude for what we have and break the chains that would hold us for what we think we don't have. And this is so cool. It's one of those great paradoxes that 
Scripture gives to us and our relationship with God brings to us. You see, when we become grateful, and develop that attitude of gratitude, it opens the door for greater blessing. It opens the door for greater blessing. I shared a couple of weeks ago, and, and I preached it, but it's, it's just a powerful thought. If you recall from Luke chapter 17, Jesus came through a town, and there were ten lepers, or ten men who were inflicted with a disease of the skin that required them to be isolated from community. They yelled out to him. And the Lord said, go and show yourself to the priest. And they went, and as they were going, they, they were cleansed. The word there is uh, uh, carthesio, where we get cathartic. Or just, it means literally to remove or to take any uh, uh, un wanted or unhealthy thing from him. They were cleansed, and in that, it says that they were healed uh, to be made physically well. And so as, as they're going, and they're doing simply what Jesus asked them to do, and so nine of them kept on going, but one turned around. One turned around. And he came back, and he fell at the feet of Jesus. And it's and I want to just read verses 15 through 19. It says, One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, Where are not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one has returned to give praise to God except this foreigner. Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now we've heard that. Maybe you've probably heard it many times. You see, the nine guys got a physical healing. The one guy got a complete healing. Got a complete healing. And, and what's so interesting is, is that he's a guy that really, if you will look at it, had nothing. Because he's a Samaritan. And he had a communicable disease that isolated him not only from the community he was in, but from all community. He was rejected all the way around. And, and what I want to just share with you is that there's something powerful. When you thank God for what you have now, it opens the door for him to do even more in your life. Now, those nine guys went away physically healed, but they still had problems that we're going to be with them for the rest of their life. But this one guy, he was, he, he, he was the least likely candidate. He had, le le he had the least likely reason to do this, but he's the one guy that comes back and falls on his face and says, thank you. Thank you for healing my body. Thank you for making me whole, taking this disease away from me. Thank you not expecting anything else. He was just grateful for what God had done in his life. He had received something that just caused his heart to overflow with gratitude. And as he falls on his face, Jesus looks at him and says, I'm not done yet. Because you came back, because you were thankful, I'm going to do more than you could ever have imagined. I'm going to heal you in ways you never knew possible. Your name's going to be written in the Lamb's book of life. And those things that this disease has done to you, I'm going to bring back everything the enemy took. Oh, it's exciting. I want to challenge us. As we head into this season, that we'd be thankful for what we have and not get upset about what we don't have and let God bring to us what we don't even know we need. I want to, man, it's easy to buy into the cultural framework of discontent, to walk a life of complaining 
and lack of gratitude. But we have been blessed beyond measure. We have been made rich in ways that cannot be understood or explained. And when we fall on our face and we thank God for the abundant bounty He's brought into our life, when we begin to thank Him for the things that we perceive that we have, not even what we don't know we have, but we perceive that we have. When we begin to thank him, just like that guy, all he knew was he had been physically healed. He knew he didn't have leprosy anymore. That's what he knew. So he thanked him for what he perceived he had. And what he did was he didn't realize in his thanking God for what he perceived he had, he received more than he could ever perceive. I know that just, but I'm just, oh, We start thanking God. Get our focus off of us and on to Him. Begin to say, Lord, I believe that you exist, that you have redeemed me. I believe that you hold me in your right hand. I believe that you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I thank you for what you've done and who you are, and I want to give you glory and praise. I want to enter into your courts with thanksgiving. I want to declare my praise for you. I want to tell you how good you are in spite of what's going on around me. I know you're still the Lord. I know you're still the one who's creator. I declare who you are and I'm grateful for it what will happen is all those shackles you know where you think you know I, I, if I had a different husband it'd be all better watch out now <laughs> or if I had a different car different house you know you know we, we get caught up in but when we begin to thank God for who he is and thank him for what he has given us you know what happens it opens the door for him to pour more into our life when we release what we want to thank God for what we have. <laughs> it's amazing what God can do. Amen? How many of you have ever had an image of what should be in your life? Any of you have that? How many of you know that that image is not going to happen? I'm just telling you. The only house that's going to look like what you really want is when you go to heaven. Because here's the deal. You could get that house, and you know what will happen? You'll find out it has bad places in it. It just, you know. You can get that new car, and you know what happens? Pretty soon you have to start buying new car smell. <laughs> or you get that outfit, and within six months it will be out of style. Or that computer, it's even sooner. <laughs> that phone, or that toy, all that stuff leaves a false sense. But there is one who never fails. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His love endures forever. Whew. It's good stuff. So as you leave behind our Thanksgiving holiday, don't leave behind your attitude of gratitude. Let it permeate your entire life. Let it 
push you through this Christmas season so you can celebrate it without discontent or failure or all the things that Satan wants to bring. Amen? Lord, I 